In this video, we'll talk about diagnostic performance. Evaluation of diagnostic performance is based on two by two contingency matrices that we're already familiar with. And we will start with a familiar example, the language screening example, in which we have teachers completing a rating checklist fitted against a clinical evaluation using a specific standardized assessment test used to detect developmental language disorder. Each child is classified as either language impaired or non-impaired by each of the two instruments. So we have two categorical variables, a checklist classification as language impaired or non-impaired, and a clinical classification as language impaired or non-impaired. And these are the numbers of children that were classified in each of the two categories according to teacher ratings down the rows and according to the clinical evaluation across the columns. For example, there were 13 children who were rated as impaired on the basis of both the clinical and the teacher scale and 85 children who were classified as non-impaired according to both instruments out of a total of 149 children and the sum of the agreements divided by the grand total indicated an agreement of 66 percent over the two instruments. We have seen in a previous video that this amounts to a non-significant difference in proportions for this contingency matrix, which leads us to not reject the null hypothesis that the two variables are unrelated. Importantly, for that kind of analysis, we treat these two kinds of classifications as just two variables. However, in certain instances, possibly including this one, the two different variables do not stand on equal footing. Instead, one of the two variables can be treated as valid diagnosis, can be treated as the truth in other ways. So our reference variable is what is considered correct. And there we are essentially judging or evaluating the adequacy of the other instrument. So in this sense, this would be valid diagnosis. So we have 32 children who are language impaired and 117 children who are not language impaired. Against this background, there are teacher ratings from these checklists and children from the two categories from impaired children and non-impaired children are classified based on these teacher ratings resulting in these numbers so now instead of talking about agreement we talk about accuracy how accurate is this teacher rating instrument in classifying the children correctly into the impaired and non-impaired category. Accuracy is the total number of correctly classified children divided by the total. It's the same as the one we called agreement before when the two variables were seen more symmetrically. Now there's a clear asymmetry. So in this sense, we can use detection terminology. If there is a valid classification taken to be true, we can evaluate any other instrument attempting to replicate that classification. So the terminology that is used in the detection literature is that when a case is correctly classified, so a case of language impairment, is detected correctly, that is called a hit. So these are the hits, how many hits were counted using this rating instrument. When a case of language impairment is not detected, it is missed. So these are the misses, 
when a non-case, so someone who is not language impaired, is misclassified as language impaired, that's called a false alarm or false positive. And when someone who's not impaired is correctly judged to be not impaired, that is called a correct rejection. So not detected as impaired, and that is correct. So how is the diagnostic performance of the instrument evaluated based on the hits, misses, false alarms, and correct rejections? The first important index is the proportion of children who are impaired who are correctly detected. So how many of the impaired children are actually detected by this screening instrument, this checklist? If we divide 13 by 32, we derive what is called the sensitivity of the instrument. And that's 41%. The teacher rating checklist only detects 40%, 41% of language impaired children. That is not a very high proportion. So sensitivity is relatively low for this instrument. The other index we can calculate is related to the children who are not impaired. Of those children who are not impaired, what proportion are correctly classified as not impaired? So divide 85 by 117. This is called specificity. How specific is the detection provided by this instrument? If it is specific, it will always reject those who aren't impaired. If it is non-specific, it will detect children who aren't impaired. In this case, specificity is 73%. In other words, sensitivity concerns the correct classification of cases. Cases here means language impairment. And specificity concerns the correct classification of non-cases, those who are not language impaired. But this is not all the information we need. If we were to start using this instrument, these ratings as a screening, instead of the clinical evaluation, our reference variable, which is considered to be true, then we wouldn't be seeing these numbers anymore. Instead, we would be seeing the report of our new instrument. So we have to evaluate our instrument also on the basis of the marginal sums of the rows in order to see how dependable the outcomes are. Turning to the rows, we see that of the 45 children reported as language impaired by the teacher rating scale, only 13 are actually impaired. If we divide these numbers, we see that this is less than one third, it's 29%. This is called the positive predictive value. Sometimes it's called precision. The precision of this screening is low, is 29%. This means that a child that is classified as language impaired by the instrument has only a 29% probability of actually being impaired. Moving on to the second row, out of 104 children classified as non-impaired, only 85 were in fact non-impaired. So the negative predictive value of this test is 82. The positive predictive value indicates the trustworthiness of case identification. If this instrument identifies a case, what is the proportion of those identified that are actual cases? The negative predictive value is the opposite. If the instrument identifies someone as a non-case, what is the probability that they actually aren't a case? These four indices, 
express all the information that there is about a screening or diagnostic test, assuming that there is a reference classification that can be considered to be true. These indices cannot be interpreted in isolation. None of the indices that we encountered can be seen in isolation from the others because there is a very important variable we haven't considered yet, which is the prevalence of the condition. The prevalence of the condition is the proportion of the population that actually has the condition we're trying to detect. And in order to be able to evaluate a test, this is a very important parameter. Let's see why. Let's start with the first and easiest case of accuracy that is a generally useless index for evaluating diagnostic performance. Cervical cancer is fortunately a relatively rare condition. I looked up some numbers and it looks like it occurs in about one in 500 women in the United States. Imagine you make a test that you call a screening test for cervical cancer, but it's a completely bogus test and always says, no, you don't have cancer because only one in 500 have cervical cancer. Your test will actually be correct most of the time it will be accurate in 499 out of 500 cases, which means it will have an excellent accuracy of 99.8%. Everyone will know your test is useless because its sensitivity is 0%. It doesn't detect any cases. So accuracy is a completely useless index. That's why we don't use it in diagnostic performance and we refer to the other values. But those other values also need some care in their interpretation. Let's stay in the topic of cervical cancer and look at pap smears, which is the usual screening procedure. According to the literature, the sensitivity of this procedure is somewhere between 50 and 75%, and the specificity is about 95%. The prevalence, one in 500, is 0.2%. Let us use the worst case scenario first, where sensitivity is only 50%. Out of 10,000 women with a prevalence of 0.2%, 20 will have cervical cancer. And the screening procedure at a 50% sensitivity will detect 10 of them. So 10 will go undetected, they're misses. And a specificity of 95% means that 95% of these will indeed be correctly rejected. So these are the numbers for these indices. And what this means is that the positive predictive value is 2%. There are 509 out of 10,000 women who are classified as positive by this screening test. And of these, only 10 actually have the condition. So the positive predictive value is 2%. The negative predictive value on the other hand is very high, it's 99.9. .9. What if we use the better scenario of 75% sensitivity? then out of the 20 women that have the condition in the population of 10,000, 15 are detected. In this case, the positive predictive value is 15 out of 514, which is almost 3%, and the negative predictive value is 99.95%. These numbers indicate that if you get a negative result, you get a slight increase in your relief. You had one in 500 chance. Now it's less than one in a thousand. If you get a positive result, the doctor says, don't worry and orders a second test. And if necessary, a follow-up biopsy because the probability 
that there's actually something wrong, even in the best case scenario, is only 3%. So you are vastly more likely to not have cervical cancer with the positive result on your screening test than to actually have it. And that's why doctors are not very worried by positive results. Let us look at a different example. COVID-19 antibody testing. Antibody tests tell whether you've had the disease so that you now have antibodies in your body. Their sensitivity varies greatly because it's very low in the beginning and increases a few weeks after you've had the symptoms, reaching its maximum a couple of weeks after you've had symptoms. These tests tend to have quite high specificity at 98%. The prevalence in this case is the proportion of people who've had the disease and now have antibodies for COVID-19 in their bloodstream. So at a relatively early stage in the pandemic, where only 1% of people have had the disease and under the assumption of relatively late testing following symptoms, so high sensitivity of 90%, these are the relevant numbers for a hypothetical 10,000 people who've been tested. If only 1% of the population have antibodies, this means that picking 10,000 people will result in 100 of them having antibodies and a sensitivity of 90% means that 90 of them will be correctly detected. These are our hits. Specificity of 98% means that 98% of those not having antibodies will correctly be rejected here. The positive predictive value of this test is 31.3%. So of those reported to have antibodies, therefore considered immune, only one third will actually be immune. The rest will be false alarms because this specificity is not perfect. It's only 98%, but the low prevalence makes this number to be higher than this number. So in the early stages of the pandemic, a positive antibody test only gives you a 31 chance, less than a third chance of actually being immune. The negative predictive value on the other hand is quite high, but then you were quite probable to not have antibodies before anyway, because you're talking about early stages. In later stages in the pandemic, assuming that 50% of the population has actually contracted the disease, and it's been enough weeks after the symptoms that the sensitivity that we can work with is still high, if you tested 10,000 people in the population, now you'd expect half of them to have antibodies and detecting 90% of them and detecting 98% of those not having contracted it yet. So the positive predictive value is 97.8% and the negative predictive value is 90.7%. These are both high numbers that can be trusted with much higher confidence. What about the rapid antigen tests? These are tests that are meant to show if you have just contracted the disease, if you now have the virus, not if you've had the sickness in the past. These aren't the PCR tests that are considered to be extremely accurate. These are the rapid tests that everyone can take that very quickly indicate whether you've, had, you've contracted the virus or not. The best among these tests have a sensitivity around 95% and a very high specificity about 
The prevalence that is relevant for this calculation is not known because it depends on who gets tested. So if we assume that 5% of those who get tested actually have contracted the virus. So if only people who've been somehow exposed to the virus or have symptoms or have uh, some reason to suspect that they've been exposed to the virus, that they've contracted it, such that at least a 5% of those taking the test actually have the virus, then we can work with these numbers. 5% of 10,000 means 500 people with the virus out of the 10,000. The sensitivity of 95% will mean that we detect 475 of them. And so the positive predictive value of the test in this population will be 475 divided by 522, which is very high, it's 91%. And of course, it helps that the specificity is so high that only a few false positives here can trickle up from the negative side. And the negative predictive value is also very high. What if you were to test the whole population? The number of active cases at a given time point over the whole population is relatively small as long as the pandemic is under control. So looking at the number of active cases, we can estimate a prevalence of around 0.05% at any given time. Now the same test characteristics, if we test a million people indiscriminately without any symptoms or any reason to suspect that contracted the virus, just go out in a population with this prevalence, we get a positive predictive value of only 8.7%. Because even with such a high specificity, the low prevalence means that there are enough false positives that are actually many more than the true positives. The negative predictive value is very, very high. But if you get a positive rapid antigen test, in a widespread population testing, your chances of actually having contracted the virus are fairly small. So this is an argument why widespread testing over whole populations with these kinds of tests is not advised. So these four indices, sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value, are the important numbers you need to keep in mind whenever you hear about a diagnostic or screening test for any condition, whether they're medical or educational or anything else. 